it's time for God to give the church the last day message outside of the seven thunders. The seven thunders actually in the scriptures have the last unrevealed message that John did not write down, even for us to interpret. So that would be messages that will come later in prophecy time. But in the time we live in, I would like to interest you in the present word, the present truth. And uh, I hope you're as interested in the Bible as these men are here that are some of them Bible scholars and even peers of mine. But I share with you what the Lord has given me. In Matthew, the 23rd chapter, there's an interesting exchange. And I'll start there. And you can make notes. And this is also on CD. And this also is going out. I'd like to say, God bless you, Brother Quinn in Louisville, Kentucky. He's watching this afternoon, along with hundreds of others across the United States. And Brother Quinn said, Brother Marlowe, any time you all teach the Bible, I'm listening from Louisville. So I thank the Lord for that. Brother Quinn, may the Lord bless you and your family. In the 23rd chapter of Matthew, the gospel of the tax collector that turned honest and wrote us a book and left behind uh, one of the epistles. In Matthew 23, um, I want to go to verse, uh, uh, let me start with, let me get my setting here. Um, the, the discussion centered, uh, as usual, around the Pharisees. And, and he was, um, he, let me go down to where I get my, my setting, yes. All right, go to the verse um, 16 of Matthew 23. And of course, the verse above it tells you who he's speaking to. He's speaking to the Pharisees, the hypocrites, and he's saying to them in verse 16, woe unto you. Now in this chapter, there's several woes. You blind guides which say, whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Now this was simple tradition. It was not scripture. It was the tradition of the elders of Israel, the Pharisees, the hypocrites. And Jesus was pointing out the foolishness of them swearing by the temple and saying it is nothing but the gold of the temple, which would have been, of course, the golden altar and if you take it literally, in the holy place, um, he is a debtor. But the temple was nothing. They, by their tradition, was making void the commandment of God and teaching in vain the doctrines of men. Then in verse 17, he said, You fools and blind, for whether it is, which, whether it is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctified the gold. It takes the temple to sanctify the gold. Uh, the gold that, and I'll drop this thought in, and it's just my thought, uh, it's my allusion to the scripture. Um, the gold that is in you is Christ in you. But it takes Christ to sanctify that gold. And he is greater. He is greater than that which is in you. Because that which is in you uh, using Job again, I used it last night, I'll use it again, the 10th the verse of the 23rd chapter of Job, the Lord knoweth the way I take, and when he had tried me, I shall come forth as pure gold. Gold has always been the standard of all metals. It is the highest of cost. It is considered the most valuable. And Jesus was saying, you are making an object of tradition greater than the temple. And the temple is to be the house of God. 
my house shall be called. Jesus said, uh, you have made my house a den of thieves. But he said, but my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. So the temple was to be greater. They were making tradition greater than the meaning or the picture of Jehovah God among them. And whatsoever or whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing, but whosoever swear by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. You fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. It takes Christ to sanctify whatever gift I place on the altar. I can place on the altar whatever I will place, but it takes Christ to sanctify that gift. Uh, so Christ is greater than that which I place upon Christ, the gift or the altar. And then in verse uh, 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 20, Whosoever therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he's through with this lesson. He's through with this lesson, and he's going to give the meaning of this lesson even clearer, showing that the tradition of worship, the tradition of that which is liturgical, orthodox, religious, can never overshadow Christ or Jehovah God or the Holy Ghost working in the temple and, and you being the temple and the you sanctifying your gift upon the altar, which is Christ. As he said in the 13th chapter of Hebrews, we have an altar whereby they which serve the tabernacle have no right to eat of that altar. Christ is our altar. Yes. The Hebrews had an altar called brazen, flesh hooks in it. Yes. They had an altar called the golden altar. It was material. Our altar is Christ. Yes. He's greater than the temple. Yes. He's greater than the gift. Yes. And that sanctifies uh, that gift, the altar. And then he said, and the verse um, 23, now this is what I wanted to come down to. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, again a woe. Hypocrites. <coughs> you know, I pray God will never look at me. And whether he says it out loud, he'll look at me in a place of worship and say, you hypocrite. In other words, you are false faith. You're not real. The only way he wants is for me to measure up to his word and let my thoughts be his thoughts and my ways his way and to be sanctified on the altar. Uh, that he wouldn't say that to me. You, you hypocrite. You Pharisee. Uh, God deliver me from that. You say, Brother Marlowe, he won't tell the whole church. But whether he told the whole church or not, he, if, if God looks at me that way, that's enough. Yes. I don't want God to look at me but any way but being righteous before him. Amen. I want him to look at me as being righteous before him. Yes. Not perfect, but righteous. Yes. Not perfect, but righteous. Yes. And, uh, and so he said now in verse 23, Woe unto your scribes, and Pharisees, hypocrites, where you pay tithe, many deals with giving, of mint, that's a plant, that's an herb, which they offered, and an ice, that's a plant, that comes from plant life, an herb, and cumin, that's also a plant. You know, these are all plant life that's offered as a sacrifice or involving sacrifice and the different meat offerings, sacrificial offerings yes. of Israel. And many of these were added by the Pharisees. Moses gave 10 commandments. <coughs> the Levitical priesthood added 603 others. Uh, Moses gave 10 
basic commandments. The Levitical priesthood added 603 others through the book of Leviticus, Exodus, uh, Deuteronomy. Uh, so there were 613 laws from the original 10 that was given on Sinai. And so he said, you do pay tithe, but you've omitted. You've left out. I don't want God to say that to me as a pastor in my closing years before the coming of Christ here, leading the church. I don't want him to say that to you after years of the Holy Ghost in your life, experiences with God, dreams, healings, blessings. And then the Lord look at us and say, but you've left out. You've omitted the weightier matters of the law and what are these some of these judgment mercy and faith you you're not weighing very much in these you're weighing a lot in paying your tithe of men and ice cumin but you are not weighing enough in these and the, the bible has a law of balance yes. and weight in it oh, yes. the bible has a um, the Bible said every man is clean in his own eyes. But the Lord will the Spirit. See, every man is clean in his own eye. But the Lord will the Spirit. How much does my spirit weigh? Impress. What kind of invitation do I make with God? Oh, I may make an invitation with you, Brother Ferris. But what kind of invitation do I make with God? See, that's more important. I may, I may impress you, but I may not impress God at all. Because my spirit wouldn't be right. I wouldn't be knowledgeable as I should be. I wouldn't be taught as I should be uh, because I wouldn't be instructed. The Bible said, rebuke a fool and he will hate you. Yes. <laughs> rebuke a wise man and he will be yet wiser. Uh, a scorner will scorn you if they're reproved. But a wise man will learn from you if that reproof is of God. If it's of God, that person will learn when they're reproved. When I was growing up in the church, my pastor reproved me many times. And I lived in a day when we didn't take things as we take them now. You can't reprove very many people now. You can't rebuke very many people now. I lived in a day when it was rebuke you and you take it. And you keep the right spirit. And you not get upset. And you not walk out of the building. And you not leave the pastor. My pastor, one time I was up testifying, I was always zealous as a young man. I got up five times one night in one service when I was a young man. Uh, my pastor finally had to say, Brother John, give somebody else a chance. I didn't say too much when I got up. I said, thank God I'm saved. Praise God. I was a young man in my teens. Glad to I'd be serving the Lord. And I sat down on the front seat down here. And finally, after five times, he said, Brother John, sit down and give somebody else a chance. Well, he willed me. He cooked me. But I survived the cooking. Because I kept the right spirit. I kept the right spirit. I knew to keep the right spirit. I knew if I didn't, he'd deal with me later on. And one time I was up preaching and I just got a first suit I ever owned. He bought me the first Elgin wristwatch. And I was and I was flashing my arms and I was holding that and I knew what I was doing. I wanted everybody to know I had a new Elgin watch. And I wore a white shirt. And I had a suit. And I was coming up in the world. And Brother Roberts pulled my coattail. And he said, sit down. You're going to make a fool of yourself. You're in the flesh and you're not in the spirit. Well, I willed it and was cooked. But thank God I stood the cooking. Yeah. Yeah. If you can't stand the heat, you better not be in the kitchen. 
Thank God for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yes. Yes. They could stand the heat. Yes. They were in the fiery furnace. Yes. But a fourth man appeared. Oh. And a fourth man will be there with you. Oh, yes. If you'll let him be there. Yes. But if you take the wrong spirit and become a fool, when you're reproved, then you'll go out in the drop and not, not be uh, safe. But here, Jesus said, now you've omitted the weightier matters of the law, such as judgment. You're judging one another. That's why he said in Matthew 6, judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And the same measure you made, it shall be measured again. Did you ever think that when you're sitting, discussing somebody by name, pouring out what you know about them, discussing it on the phone, making comments, making judgment. Did you know that same judgment can come back to you? And that same measure can be measured back to you? Jesus said it would be. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. What measure you make, it shall be measured to you again. And so in the scriptures, judgment plays a part of how I'm to judge. The Bible said, can I judge anything, Brother Marlow? The Bible said, he that is spiritual, in the book of Corinthians, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things. If I'm spiritual, I can evaluate any condition, any situation around me, and I'll be spiritual enough to handle it and not get into gossip with it. I'll be spiritual enough to say what I need to say and say it to the right person in wisdom and in honor, and so that person will receive it. So you've admitted the way in our law, such as judgment, faith. We're trying to build faith again in the church. We're trying to build faith in your life. Have faith in what the ministry is preaching. Have faith in what God is giving the church for today. Have faith. Uh, for what the Lord is saying through the Holy Ghost. Have faith in the vision that God's planning in the church. Yes. Then mercy. Mercy. Can I show mercy? I used to sing a song here in the church. There is a lesson I've learned about mercy. Yes. If I show mercy, that means I could take your life, but I won't. That means I could slander you, but I won't. That means I could speak evil of you, but I won't. That means I could be jealous of you, but I won't. That means I could be of the wrong spirit, but I won't be. Because I'm showing mercy. Judgment, faith, and mercy. These are weightier matters of the law than, than all this business about the temple and the gold and the altar. And you're arguing and you're disputing about this. But the weightier matters of the law. Because there's a, there's a balance in the house of God. And the church must be balanced and temperate before the coming of Jesus. That's why the ministry must get busy and do a work right now. We must get the proper understanding of the scriptures as ministers. We must get the proper anointing to deliver that understanding. Get what I'm saying. The ministry right now, if you are a minister, if you're one to lead the church, if you're one to tell the church, instruct the church, then you need to get a proper understanding of the scriptures. Then you need to get a proper anointing to deliver that. And then you must have a proper life lived to be an example of that. Three things that ministry must do. It must get a proper understanding of the scriptures to feed the sheep, feed the lambs, Amen. to prepare the church, to get the church ready, to move the church from where it is or might be to where it needs to be, and uh, to be leaders. The Levites were leaders. When they carried the Ark of the Covenant across the Jordan River, it was on the shoulders of the Levites. They were the chosen tribe. Everybody could not 
did not pick up that uh, all that that uh, uh, that cover 